Welcome to our information session about the Cohere for AI Scholars Program. Uh, we're really excited to talk about this today. Um, my name is Ellie. I'm the operations lead for Cohere for AI, and I'm joined by the inimitable Sarah Hooker, who is head of Cohere for AI. And we're going to talk everything Scholars Program today. So we're very excited. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. We are going to have a Q&A session. If you have questions as we're going through the information today, please use the Q&A function to submit your question. You'll find the little button at the bottom of your screen. Cool. I'm going to get started. There we go. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We've got four parts to our presentation this morning. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a bit about the Scholars Program, an overview of what we're trying to do and what the structure of the program is. I'm going to talk about how to approach the application, the different components, what you can expect with that application process. Uh, I'm going to go over some tips and tricks, how to submit a really strong and awesome application. And then we're going to have an open Q&A, which Sarah is going to helm for us. So again, if you've got questions, please submit them through the Q&A function below. All right. Before we really get into it, I did want to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about Cohere for AI. Generally, um, you may have found out about this webinar through all sorts of means. You may not actually know what we do a whole lot. So welcome, and Cohere for AI is a great place for you. We're a nonprofit research lab, and we're a community dedicated to contributing fundamental research in machine learning, and we're working to solve some of the field's most challenging problems. Uh, Cohere for AI spans lots of exciting programs. Uh, we support community-driven research. Um, if you haven't joined our Cohere for AI Discord, you absolutely should. Um, our community outreach lead, Madeline, is also doing some chat moderation for us today. She'll be the one behind the screen submitting links for you to access. But join our community if you aren't a member already. Um, we have launched the Cohere for AI Scholars Program. That's why you're here today to learn more about that. We also have our full-time research positions and lab and our fireside chat speaker series, which you can get our replay videos on our YouTube channel. So if you didn't see us last week, we had an awesome kickoff fireside chat. You can find the replay video online. Fundamentally, Cohere for AI has a really strong mission, and our mission is changing where, how, and by whom research is done. And that is a big part of why we have the Scholars Program and why we decided to launch this. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about the Scholars Program. We're going to go over this at a glance so you can understand what an amazing opportunity this is. So why a Scholars Program? Why do this? A um, few reasons. Progress in machine learning is moving at an incredible pace, and broadening access to participation in fundamental research, it's essential to pioneering new advancements. We need more people in the space with a diverse array of backgrounds to help advance machine learning. There are very few settings to conduct research on NLP problems. There's limited access to large-scale ML experimental settings. Getting access to compute can be challenging, uh, among other resource constraints. Um, and finally, our goal is we really want to identify and support the next generation of rising stars as they embark on their research journey. So there are sort of three planks to why we decided to launch a scholars program. So now I'm going to get into a few specifics about the C4AI scholars program, the big things. If you remember not much else from this session, this was probably the stuff that you came to know. Um, it is an eight-month full-time research apprenticeship, so this will run from January to August 2023. So because it is full-time, this isn't the kind of program that would play well or you could do alongside uh, if you're already in a in an uh, academic program, if you're already working full-time, it's not designed to be done in conjunction with another full-time commitment. It really is a full program. You're going to be working on a real-world research project. It is going to require time and attention. We want to really be able to support people in creating a successful research experience, so it's full-time. It is remote first and paid because we want to identify and support emerging talent from around the world. So you don't have to relocate to participate in the Scholars Program. If you are near one of our Cohere offices, so that's in, if we're in California, if you're in Toronto, if you're uh, in London, in the UK, uh, you are more than welcome to stop by the office. If you're a research scholar, you can access that space in the community there. But you do not have to relocate to participate in the program if you're a successful applicant. 
And finally, you are supported by an in-house research team. We have amazing research staff here at Cohere and Cohere for AI, and you'll be partnered with dedicated project and professional mentorship. It really is a team of people around you supporting you as you start on this research journey. So we are different from other fellowship or scholarship programs you may have heard of from other places because we are searching for emerging talent with strong machine learning skills. But what we're really specifically looking for are early career researchers. Uh, we're looking for people that have a very limited or no, or pu no publication track record. Um, we're also not insisting on previous lab experience. We really want to find people who are talented at the beginning of their research journey and looking for that first door to open. We really want this opportunity with the Scholars Program to be that open door for you. Okay. I'm going to talk about how to approach the application. Uh, we've got lots of really great questions through various means, uh, asking questions about the application. Hopefully, if you have, if you've looked at the application, even if you haven't, this will give you a good idea of what to expect and some strong tips about how to approach the application and submit a really strong and compelling application to us. So there are three parts to the Scholars Program application. First is a take-home challenge. So this is a technical exercise. There's a personal statement, which is a written response. And then there is a video interview component as well. So I'm going to go into all three of these in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna start with the take-home challenge. I think this generates far and away the most questions for us. So hopefully this will give you a good grounding in what to expect. What the challenge is designed to do is showcase engineering and problem solving skills. So it is a practical way to demonstrate the skill and creativity that you have. There are three parts to it. First is identifying bugs and getting code working. This is a practical challenge. It's designed to test your ability to take on an engineering problem, break it down, and show us how you go about doing this. Second part of the challenge is testing your ability to generate code for a specified problem. And then the third part is optional. It is a challenge question that's designed to extend the original problem set. So it is a pretty classic take-home challenge in terms of structure. If there are some big tips that we have for approaching the take-home challenge, a couple of things here. Maximize partial points. So you'll see that there are point values throughout the take-home challenge. If you, you're like, oh, I don't know if I can get all of this, get as much as you can. Go for those partial points, even if you don't think you can get all of it. Better to give us a, as strong an answer as you can than nothing at all. And that, and related to that, if you've got an unexpected result, something isn't behaving the way that you expected, or you, you put something in, you're like, hmm, I would have expected X to happen, but it's Y instead. Tell us, walk us through your thinking, give us the setup for what you tried. Okay. I am going to talk a little bit more about the personal statement. So this is the written response portion of the application. Um, and it is an opportunity to let us know who you are and what you're hoping to achieve. Um, this is the text of the personal statement. So this is the actual question that we ask in the application if you haven't seen the posting itself. Here's how we're framing this. We want to know more about your interest in machine learning and we want to know about your research interests and goals. So please use the space to write a brief, so it's 500 words or less, personal statement. This is your opportunity to provide context for your experience and let us know what participating in the program would mean to you. So a couple of things here. First of all, I want to highlight the word count. 500 words is pretty tight. Uh, you need to be efficient in this space and you need to be really clear as well. Uh, sometimes writing short is a lot harder than writing long. So we've given you a, a bit of a challenge there. So to help approach that, here are some things to keep in mind as you start drafting that personal statement. First is be specific and be personal. You're the only person that can tell your story. The more specific you can be, the more we're going to know about you and who you are. So specific examples, specific moments in your, your past and your experience are really, really helpful for us understanding your context and your strengths and why this program will be a good fit for you. Second, and I, I can't stress this enough, and I'm sure Sarah will also stress this as well when she uh, 
takes to the stage for the Q&A, oh, is give yourself enough time to draft your response. It does take longer than you think. Um, you want to be able to give yourself time to revise, write it, walk away from it for a couple of days, come back and redraft again. Give yourself that time. Um, at this point, I think we are 20 days away from the application close, so you still have that time. Now is a great day to get started on it. And finally, proofread. And proofread again. Uh, it's kind of wonderful how great our brains will fill in context and missing words and autocorrect typos, uh, but we really don't want those. Ask a peer, a friend, or an advisor to review your statement. They're going to notice things that your brain will have corrected and skipped over. Um, they're also going to point out maybe areas that could be stronger, that could use an extra example, or areas where you, maybe you're not giving yourself enough credit. Uh, that happens too. Also, another good tip here, try reading your statement out loud. Uh, it's a good way to stop your, yourself from auto-correcting and smoothing over those errors. You'll be able to hear how it reads, and that often throws up any points that are awkward, that are missing information, that don't have quite the transition that you're looking for. So for a lot of people, there aren't many opportunities to write personal statements. You don't have a whole lot of context for what a good one looks like. Uh, so we do have a personal statement resource document about how to draft, and we do include a sample in there. Um, this is an excerpt from that sample. Uh, many thanks to the original author for that. Um, and I did want to go over this briefly because while this particular personal statement was drafted for a graduate program, it was part of a PhD application, it does get at the things that we would really like to see in a strong personal statement. Um, so this is just the opening paragraph. I'm going to go over it real quick here. Um, this writer starts with, my research interests are natural language processing, particularly its intersection with machine learning. The prospect of teaching a computer to understand language is one that excites me the most. As new technologies emerge every day and the digital divide between dominant and low resource languages deepens, it impacts the extent to which speakers of these languages access information and communicate with these technologies. Hence, I'm interested in developing methods that will advance the state of modeling low resourced languages. This is an exciting challenge I plan to tackle by pursuing a graduate degree at the University of Washington. And the statement does continue in a lot more detail with examples, but I did want to focus on this opening paragraph because it does some things really, really well that I think are really useful to keep in mind as you draft your own statement. So most importantly, it's very clear and it's very direct. Uh, there isn't a lot of really dense or academic language in there. If there are specific terms, like say natural language processing, they're defined, they're abbreviated in a way that's really clear for the person who's reviewing the statement to follow. It's very direct. Each sentence is very distinct. It articulates why the program at this time, and it articulates this person's particular research interests. It really gives the why. Why am I interested in this? Why do I want to do this? And fundamentally, it makes the reviewer's life really easy. You can actually just track the argument and the examples through the paragraph. So again, clear, simple, direct language, clear examples. It makes whoever received that statement, they were probably very, very happy when they got that because they're like, I know exactly who this person is. I know what they want, and I know why they're interested in pursuing this opportunity. So the last part of our application is the video interview. Now, the video interview is for applicants who submit a strong take-home challenge and a strong personal statement. So not everyone will complete this. It is a second stage of the application that happens after you submit the first part. The way that this is structured is you're given a set of possible questions and you pick one to answer, just one. And you pick the one that resonates with you. There's no sort of hidden trick here with if you pick the correct question out of the set. It really is which one do you, do you feel the strongest pull to that you could speak on. Video should be short. We want a five minute maximum and we want them to be clear. And what we're interested in is a genuine and thoughtful response. We're interested in how you communicate. Uh, does not have to be stream quality background and perfect lighting. Um, just as long as it's clear, direct, we can hear you really clearly. That's what we're looking for. Again, genuine, thoughtful response. Pick the question out of the set that resonates with you. Uh, don't worry about trying to, to game or optimize the system on that one. 
What happens after I submit my application? Um, we are going to review all of the applications regardless of when they're received. That being said, applying early and starting early on your application is an advantage to you because you have it done, you have lots of time to review, and you have time to, to ask questions. So please, please, please do not leave this until the weekend before the application closes, which is November 7th. That's a Monday. Uh, get your application in early. Give yourself the benefit of time to review. We will not make any offers before the application closes. We are going to review the entire group before we make any offers. We anticipate making those offers in December for a January program start. But really, submit early if you can. Give yourself that time so you can get the application in uh, with plenty of time to review and plenty of time for us to review. So at this point, I'm going to... Stop the screen share. I'm going to turn this over to Sarah. I see we've got lots of questions flowing in. This is going to be great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Sarah Hooker, head of Cohere for AI. Um, the Scholars Program is such a core part of what we do at Cohere for AI. It's such a big part of our lab. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it over to her to talk more and answer your questions. Sarah, good morning. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Ali. That was fantastic. So I think Ali just gave you a picture of a lot of the details of what's happening in the lead up to the application. Maybe I'll kick off and share a little bit about myself and about the lab and what you could expect from the experience itself. And then we can start weaving in questions as we go. So um, I lead Cohere for AI. A lot of uh, our goal is to do curiosity-driven research. So we have both the community research group, we have our full-time research staff, and now we have the scholars program. Um, a lot of this uh, scholars program in particular is going to be an eighth-month paid opportunity to really pursue curiosity-driven research and machine learning. So I think just in terms of uh, understanding the motivation for this is really to find the most talented rising stars around the world, just strong engineers who are well positioned. This is a natural next step in their journey. Um, what you'll experience when you join the program, and then we can start slowly weaving questions in. Uh, I think this will be fun to do. Uh, to, to, to give you some context uh, and then slowly start answering some of your questions. So what the experience will look like is that we're, how we're in the process of two things at the same time. So you're applying for the scholars program in parallel, we're, we're working with um, really our research leads and our technical leads to put together strong proposals. So these proposals will skew towards NLP proposals. And what will happen is accepted scholars at the end will match with these proposals. And so you will have a sense even before you start of what proposals there are, and you'll be able to uh, align with an idea that makes sense and work with that for the eight months that you're in the program. Um, and uh, I think that's part of what's exciting is that we have some of the best research talent um, and some of the best technical talent uh, in this field. And we have this really unique setting. So we have this large scale experimental setup. So there's very few places in the world where you can study um, models at the size that we do, as well as uh, really pursue some of these questions. With that, I'm going to weave in the first question. So uh, let's see, let's start. Let's start with uh, Armel. Um, so hi, I'm trying to resolve the challenge. It's not easy because we haven't enough experience with Jax. Also, oh, the program is only for EdgeML? No. So I think it says in the challenge itself, but this is meant to be a challenge to see how you think, not to test what you're good at. And it's not meant to be representative of the type of problems we're going to answer in the, in the scholars program itself. Um, so Jax, I think part of it is that we wanted to choose in framing the whole challenge is to choose something that you may have less comfort with. And uh, in many ways, the whole setting is to see how you explore ambiguity. So I would treat it as you're not meant to be an expert on these topics, but you're meant to showcase your thinking. Um, I think Ellie mentioned go for partial points. Uh, the whole goal is to showcase your thinking throughout. That's why we give points for adding things like documentation. That's why there's 10 bonus points for doing a code review. So these are all opportunities for you to showcase your technical curiosity, as well as your command of engineering first principles. Um, so that answers our Mel's question. 
So let's see. Um, should I know what my ML area of interest is before I apply? I am unfortunately or fortunately still enthralled with basically every part of ML research and no specific angles yet. Yeah, math. That I think that speaks to the heart of many uh, like researchers out there. So no, I think part of why we're we're spending so much time on these parallel efforts of proposals is that we really want to have in place well-scoped ideas that we think are de-risked enough where we can have a huge impact, but it can fit within an eight-month process. Um, I think partly what we want to take into account is people's interests. That's partly why I'm sharing now that these proposals are skewing towards NLP because that's our expertise in-house. Um, so if you're not interested in NLP at all, maybe a future cohort is a better choice because um, it, it, this cohort in particular will skew more towards NLP proposals. But in general, we just want people to come in curious and excited and wanting to work on these topics. Um, so that, uh, I think, answers Max's uh, question. Uh, I also think it's very natural when you first start out to be interested in everything. <laughs> so the, the, that's the, not at all atypical. Um, what's the difference between the personal statement and the cover letter? Uh, so I believe Ellie is updating that wording. Um, and I'll jump in to say, so the personal statement does show up as its own distinct question that you can't bypass. The cover letter is part of just an optional if there's any additional information that you think would be helpful to us reviewing your application, that's the spot to put it. For lots of people, that is a cover letter, but that's not necessary at all. Um, so let's see. Anonymous attendee. Wow, keeping it mysterious. Is November 7th the deadline for the application? Um, so yes, it is. <laughs> the deadline for the application. Uh, we'll probably loop back with everyone by um, the, I mean, by the end of the year, we'll have finalized the cohort. And so we'll, we'll know who exists there, uh, like who, who, what our final pool is by then. Um, Stephen says, how much experience in LP do you expect in accepted candidates? Actually, this is another setting where we're not assuming that you have domain expertise. Like we're really selecting for people who are really curious and excited and have good technical command of uh, engineering discipline. But our goal is to really be the first door that opens. And so really we're trying to focus on, on uh with an emphasis, applicants who haven't published before in machine learning or in NLP. Um, oh. And I'll just tag in there for a second. There's also an additional question from Andy. Do we need to have a master's or PhD to be eligible? No, absolutely not. Um, so if you don't have one of those credentials, you are still absolutely welcome to apply. So let's see. Um, let's see, let's see. So I'm scrolling down. Okay, so Eric says, hello, I'm considering a career between machine learning engineering and machine learning research in NLP. I was wondering if you could share some thoughts about what kind of person might choose one path over the other, pros and cons, etc. Um, I actually think it's a fairly blurred line. So machine learning engineering, typically you may be working more on a product facing role and you may not, I think one of the key distinguishing factors is you may not end up publishing. But right now, the state of NLP means that both have many unanswered questions, particularly if you're working at models at scale, like there's a lot of ambiguity for both. Um, I think that one thing to consider is do you enjoy not uh, pursuing an idea end to end, or, or do you enjoy pursuing an idea deploying, iterating, seeing if you need to pursue the idea further. Um, I would say I've done both in my career. So I was at Google Brain for five years. Before that, I was at a startup where I did recommendation algorithms. I feel like both are very valuable experiences. They teach you different skills. Um, and so um, I really would say it comes down to you uh, whether your own personal appetite as well as what opportunities are open to you at any one time. Um, so I feel like we've answered Barat's question, is NLP an interest area is necessary? So I, uh, I think the answer to that was, um, or can it be across other fields? Okay, so this is actually good. Let me just reiterate this. Our proposals are gonna skew towards NLP. So if you've done, if you're really passionate about uh, for example, uh, like computer vision problems, uh, we may not have a good representation in the proposals just because particularly for this first cohort, our expertise and the research leads that we have on proposals skews towards NLP expertise. 
Um, Deutera says, for take on assignment question one, do we listen to explain? Oh, uh, or only list real world applications of low rank? Uh, I mean, I think for this, uh, I don't quite understand the, uh, the ambiguity. I guess you're saying the first option is more comprehensive. Do we listen to explain? I mean, I would always err on the side of being over comprehensive because you want the person that you who reads your your take home to be to have no doubts about what you're meaning. So, yeah, of those two options, I would say listen and explain. Um, but those are meant to be checked for understanding questions. So, you know, use the time as you see fit. What happens after the eight months of this research scholar program from Nithin? This is meant to be a launch pad. So it's meant to take you wherever you want. Uh, our goal is that it's meant to be a pre-doctoral program. So people go on to doctor programs that people will position to apply for industry jobs. Um, that really, it gives you that uh, first uh, prestigious research experience where you have an artifact by the end of it and you can choose where you wanna go next. And uh, in many ways that that's part of our goal is to make it something where it unlocks a lot of new paths for you. Um, so let's go down. Uh, I think we've answered Shamis question. Do we have research opportunities in, in machine vision? I inferred from that you mean computer vision. So um, I think we've answered that. Uh, so let's see, anonymous attendee, how much does the optional website portfolio link weigh into the candidate selection process? So um, this is a good question. I, I think we, in general, we're gonna view the profile holistically, but one of the things that it, it, it helps is it gives us a sense of what engineering projects you've done before and your technical accomplishments. It's part of your overall package. So even if you think about your past portfolio, your take home, your personal statement. One thing I will say about your personal statement, it's one place that you have complete control, right? Even if you don't have a lot of prior experience or you feel like you're getting some partial points in the take home, but you don't feel completely comfortable. This is one part of the application where it's completely within your control. I would invest there. So it's always a question of, if your portfolio, if you do have a strong portfolio, absolutely, you should add it because it gives us a sense of your past experience and adds more depth to your application. If it's weaker, your past contributions, spend more time on the parts you can control, like the personal statement, like making sure you do a great job with the bonus points in the take home. Um, and so that's my recommendation there. Uh, so Carla asked, do you also welcome people who have done research into other topics, but are interested in moving into AI? This is a great question. I think, so the spirit of what we're trying to do is really give people their first opportunity in the machine learning field. If you published a paper in a different field, like you know biology a few years ago, I think we would still feel like it was in the spirit of what we're trying to do if you applied and you didn't have machine learning publications. Uh, also machine learning workshop uh, papers, we also would look, uh, we would look at that and we would say, okay, this is not a main track publication. It's a workshop paper. It's the, they only have one workshop paper. I think that's what we're trying to capture with this criteria is that we really just want, we we're going to look very favorably upon applicants who don't demonstrate much experience and I think weigh that accordingly. Um, so to answer your question, um, Yes, if it if the only research you've done is in very distinct topics and this is your first time coming to machine learning, I would still apply. Um, and I think what I'm asking candidates to keep in mind is just the spirit of what we're trying to do. So if you've done five workshop papers, <laughs> then we might look at that a bit more like, well, are they really at the beginning of their research journey? So this is all to say, I don't like prescriptive rules, but this is what we're trying to achieve with this with this intent. Um, so I'm leaving a lot of the more uh, pre precise, like the questions about, um, I'm leaving some of the questions for Ellie at the end. Uh, one thing I'll just answer now, can you help with relocation if I want to work from office? No. So we don't support relocation. This is remote first. Um, we do support remote first anywhere. And if you're in Toronto, you can come into the office. If you're in Palo Alto, you can go into the office if you're in London, but we don't support relocation. It's a short program, it's eight months. Um, so uh, Alessio, eight months can be enough, but also short time for getting some research thoroughly done. Then the program is any choice to join, join that team to keep working on it. Um, 
So part of our intent with structuring the proposal process up front is that we're really trying to scope it so it fits within an eight-month cadence. It is small. Uh, it is short. I think that it, in many ways, we'll, we'll try and figure out ways to bridge the compute gap afterwards. Um, but it is an eight-month contract. So that's, that's the intent of the program, is to be an eight-month experience. Um, so let's go to... Is this suitable for PhD students a different discipline, i.e. physics? Uh, I think that's what I uh, was, uh, that's what I implied with the answer before. So the spirit of it, it's intended to be for someone at the beginning of their machine learning journey. Uh, if it's a very different discipline, if none of the previous research topics have been overlapping with the machine learning uh, set of tools, then uh, yes, I would still recommend applying and we'll weigh in. So let's see. What will the time commitment be throughout the eight months? This is a full-time commitment, and this is going to be a fairly uh, intense experience because you're doing a whole research cycle and training program within eight months. So that's one of the reasons why what we're, what we're really trying to capture is people who can commit to the program full-time. So that was from Azir. Um, Maria, when do you get the take-home exercise? It is live. So if you go to the portal right now, um, it is live right now. Um, so you, I would recommend getting started and looking at it. So uh, maybe, uh, Madeline, you can share the link to the Lover site, and then we can go from there. Um, Ellie, do you see any you want to take? I left some throughout that might be more related to just the logistics. Yeah, I'm just going to go through a uh, question from Noah. Do we get to work with other researchers at the company or is it solo? You are not solo. Uh, you are going to be paired with a whole support team. So you're going to have project mentorship. Uh, you will have access to our senior research staff at Cohere for AI. You're definitely not alone. Uh, again, because this is for early career researchers and this is the uh, a first sort of jumpstart opportunity, we want to make sure that you have the right personal professional support so that you can be really successful in this project. So no, you're not going to be alone. You're going to be joining a really awesome team of people. Um, it's probably one of the best reasons to join this program is the people that you do get to work with. Uh, and everyone's so excited and passionate. So you're going to be in really, really good company. Let's see. Um, let's see if we missed anything in here that is more logistical related. In terms of number of placements and number of offers, I see there are a few questions to that effect. Uh, the final size and composition of the cohort is really going to depend on the applicants that we receive and then the project matching process. So not a fixed number there. We are going to make sure that we have the right blend. Um, so the best, the best way to make sure that you're part of that blend is to submit a really strong application. Uh, Jason asked a good question. Could our own ideas after vetting be considered in this program? Uh, uh, Ling Shi also says interested in this too. So uh, really, uh, so I guess the timing to propose this would be in the final pool. I will say a lot of the emphasis is going into proposal scoping with paired mentors. So uh, I will say if this is a key criterion of you applying, uh, I just want to set expectations that uh, it's not it's not clearly part of this process. So I think as to, as with any research cycle, once we get to the final pool, if someone feels strongly, I have this great idea, I think it would be amazing that we share, and we all agree it would be amazing, I would say, you know, still go for it. <laughs> in general, this is my advice, you know, outside of this program as well in life, like you should always put your ideas out there and see how, you know, does it work. Um, but we are spending a lot of time scoping these proposals, particularly so that they will be de-risked enough where we feel like, wow, this is a great idea. It will have a high impact, but also it can fit within this eight month. And we have mentors which are associated with it. Um, so just to say the timing for proposing your idea would be when you get to the final pool. Um, but I would also say the whole program is being geared towards making sure that we've scoped a lot of proposals in advance. Um, so yeah, it's a balance, but um, I hope that gave some insight into that question. Aisha asked, what is the expected, uh, expected output from the selected scholars at the end of the program? Um, so we really want to support you in having a research artifact, like where you know, where whether that be 
um, a, a top tier publication or a technical blog post, uh, but the emphasis is, is in submitting for publication works at the end of it. So I think that we are scoping the proposals with the view that they should have scientific merit and be publishable. Um, I hope that answered this one. So uh, Uzair says, I'm a full-time student outside of summaries. Will I be able to participate in the program? No, uh, unfortunately. I think that our intent is that we um, we really support people who can do this full time, just because it is a short time. It's like eight months to iterate end to end on a project. And so we want to make sure we're giving it to people who can really leverage that opportunity. Um, so Harash says, I'm in a master's program. Do I have to show proof I can pause my degree with application? Um, so if you can pause your degree for eight months, uh, you should feel welcome to apply. Um, I would say, if, I don't know what the proof is, <laughs> but uh, Ellie, go for it. I would say you you don't need to to give us give us proof. You don't need to show us the receipts in the application process. But if that's something you're interested in doing, that should be a, a, a very serious conversation you have with your graduate program. Have yeah. a chat with your grad program coordinator <laughs> about whether or not that's feasible for you. Um, and if you are a successful applicant just we can we can help you with that but yeah just think really carefully in advance about whether that's the right move for you but we don't need to see the paperwork for it that's totally fine um here's an anonymous question need do you welcome people with no quality of research background for example law and history students so we do have a technical take home i would say if you feel comfortable with that technical take home you're probably going to feel comfortable in this program if you don't then this might not be the right program for your background but we have no explicit criterion that you know that you have to come from a certain background. In fact, um, I think part of our goal is to encourage people who are coming from many different backgrounds. We just want to be realistic about uh, what what type of skill level we would expect for someone to be able to really enjoy the program and feel like they're able to contribute. Um, um, and I just add to that too, if if you are from a non-quantitative research background and you get to that take-home test and you go, uh, okay, I'm not super comfortable with this, but I'm still curious and I still want to get involved, our community is a great place to start. Um, so the application, uh, I believe Madeline has posted it, but if you are wanting to learn more about ML research and connect with that community, join the C4AI AI Discord. That's a great place to start as well. Uh, that was great. I, I think that's a great suggestion from Ellie. David says, uh, I am a master of science. Part of my program, I need to complete a research internship May to December. Uh, no, it's not possible to start the scholars program in May. Everyone starts at the same time. The main reason is that we want people to have a cohort and friendship amongst the scholars. And part of that is starting at the same time, ending at the same time. So this is part of our commitment that there's also a peer group within the program. Um, so alas, it's not possible. Yeah, uh, and I think there are a couple of related questions to that about uh, pairing this as an internship program for the purposes of meeting an academic qualification. It's not certified as that. It is a standalone program. So like the similar comment about pausing the program to participate in the scholars program, that's a conversation that you should be having with whoever your program coordinator is. But if you're looking for a program to fulfill a specific internship designation in your degree, we are not quite that opportunity for you. Yeah, Tan says, I publish in Nordic CHI and interactive media experience. I will have my PhD when the program starts, video production tools with AI. Do I still qualify for the position? Was it possible to start a month late? My job is three months long, so it's not possible to start late. Uh, I don't really know just from that sentence whether you would qualify or not. Uh, this relates to, I have a background in as a ML scientist at a big tech company, and there's another question like I've been working in NLP. So if you've been working with machine learning in an applied setting and you've been doing NLP in applied setting, you're still welcome to apply for this program. Our goal is to really bring people at the beginning of their research journey. So our one criterion is you cannot have published in machine learning before, but if you've been doing applied machine learning and applied NLP, you're very welcome to join. I feel like you would still learn a lot about 
the publication process and doing research and how that differs from your day-to-day -day applied. So those types of applications are still very welcome. Uh, so this relates to anonymous attendee if one has applied NLP experience, not research without be okay. 100%, that's part of our goal is to support people who are coming in with zero research experience who want to really uh, experience the research side and to publish. Um, so that's very welcome. Maria has a great question. Is this open for people outside the USA and Venezuelan? Yes, 100%. We're a remote boat first, and that's very intentional. Like we want to support talent all over the world. And so we just uh, can support relocation because it's a very short program. <laughs> but that being said, we're really going above and beyond to support you having a full-time, you know, a full-time eight-month position wherever you are. And so you can apply from Venezuela. Uh, Tan says, I've applied for Discord a few weeks ago and haven't heard back. Okay, uh, you should email info at 4AI and I think Madeline can help sort out and figure out maybe why that was missed. Um, so Curtis says, how strongly would you consider candidates with several years of software engineering experience but no direct ML? Yeah, I think that's great. Again, this is the type of candidate we want to support. Um, because our goal is really that we're the first door that, that opens for your research journey. And one of the big blockers to entry points right now is that there's very few entry points into machine learning research in particular. Um, so if you have applied experience, that's great. I think it would, you're very welcome to apply to this program. Alessio says, um, I have some experience with research in a single startup, a specific topic, no publication, just internal reports. That's a strong point. I mean, if you have no publications, that's exactly what we're hoping to support. So I would even say, you know, you can say that in your personal statement, what has inspired you to think more about research in particular, and you can speak to that um, and start crafting your personal statement with that in mind. So um, Ellie, have you spied any you want to answer about logistics? And just see the recurring questions about relocation and, and work permits. So again, just to emphasize, it is remote first and it is a very tight opportunity. So no, we can't support relocation. Um, I'm oh, I'm going to try to find this in, but there was a question of, you know, I'm, I think I can manage the time between a full-time academic program and being able to do this. I'm, I'm going to really strongly caution against that. Um, my background is working with, with undergraduate students and having conversations about time management and how much you can take on. This is going to be an intense program. It is very immersive, and we want to make sure that you have the time and space to be successful on this research project. So if you've got other full-time commitments, I don't think that this is the right opportunity right now. Keep an eye out for future cohorts. Um, but don't, don't, don't overbook yourself. That's probably more, more than you want to take on at this point. Uh, anonymous attendee says, does participation in the program require work permit in Canada and the US? No. So this is partly, um, oh, we've lost Ellie. <laughs> well, hopefully she'll come back. I think, but we've lost her for a second. Um, oh, there, <laughs> there there's Ellie. Um, so, um, no, it doesn't require work permit in Canada or the US. That's partly our motivation is that because we really want to really support talent all over the world, that's partly why we're trying to really put a lot of effort into being remote first. Um, so, uh, so Yishan says international student. I think we've answered this. So this is the, the we can't do part time. Um, and maybe Ellie, can you go through and clean out the ones that are we feel like have been answered in some way? Um, so let's see, are there any strict age requirements? No, <laughs> that'd be very odd if we had age requirements. Um, I, I guess, uh, technically we'd have to see minimum age requirements. Uh, I, so I don't know. I you'd have to know be, you'd, you'd have to be of, of the age, like the legal minimum age to work in, in your country, in your country. Yeah. Um, uh, but I don't have enough context about that. So let's yeah, that's probably not an, a question we can answer here. Um, so let's see. I, uh, so here's some more, uh, Ellie, are you just running through and taking care of ones that have already been answered? Yeah, and actually, quite... 
Yeah, so I'm trying to clear these out. You got awesome questions. We've gone through 56 so far. This is great. Um, I am going to pick one up about how to submit a great resume because we haven't explicitly touched on the resume. Um, there is a component in the application that is, you know, what I would say the standard stuff, letting us know, you know, contact information, that sort of thing. The same advice for a great personal statement also applies to a great resume. It's really clear. It's very direct. Um, don't go overboard with the bells and whistles on, on fancy formatting and colors and fonts. You want to present the information as clearly and directly as you can, um, wherever possible. Give us, give us examples, give us links to projects that you've worked on. Show off, show us why you're fantastic and everything that you've worked on and why you think that you would be a great fit for this program. Uh, but again, go for clarity, go for something that is going to be a really efficient showcase of who you are and your skills. And if you are really, really new, and if you don't have a lot of, let's say, formal work experience, that is okay. We definitely want to see your application. That's where writing a really strong personal statement, that area where you have control, that's going to be very helpful to you. Uh, so there's a few questions here. Uh, so there's one, which is, I'm currently working on a paper now. Um, uh, sorry, I've missed it. This, it's moving. I'm currently working on paper now. Does that count? No. So if it hasn't been published, it doesn't count. There's another one about bachelor's thesis that also doesn't count. There's a lot about pay, how much we paid. Uh, so this is an entry level role. It's paid monthly uh, and it's commensurate with uh, how we would think about like uh, an intern style role. It is pay, paid based on industry standards. So uh, I think particularly since we're being remote first, it, it, uh, I think that we'll, we'll be benchmarking to our current um, intern type roles. Um, I can't share the specifics mainly because uh, we, we it, I, I think that's a conversation when we enter the final rounds of the process. Um, but uh, we are confident that we're compensating at a reasonable level for this role and for the eight months. And it's a monthly salary, so it's not a stipend. And so you're paid for all the hours that you work, because I also saw a question about stipend. Um, so let's see. I have a background as an ML scientist at a big tech company. How would the day-to-day -day at the scholar program be different? What are the expected outcomes? Uh, so the day-to-day -day would be different. Uh, I don't know what tech company you work on. Um, I expect that it's more to do with the outcomes. So you'll be paired with this proposal. So you'll be working with your with the assigned mentors at the proposal, as well as you'll be working towards like a publication outcome. Um, so the expected outcome would be to share both your findings of your proposal as well as to share your um, your code or whatever other artifacts that you have at the end. Um, let's see. So anonymous said to me, I'm applying for a master's program for fall 2023. Can I apply for this program to get research experience? In ML, yeah, I think those dates align. So I would recommend you apply. I think that's part of the goal is like we want to help people on their next step afterwards. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. Um, will this opportunity be offered again in future years? Yes. So I would definitely recommend a part of this is even for those uh, who pursue a, uh, application and don't get in this time. I'm always a strong, uh, I always really encourage people to treat it as an experience and part of your journey. And I think part of that is that we'll offer this again. And, you know, this is part of starting to submit and getting familiar with the process. Um, and let's see. So anonymous attendee says, I have a background software engineer, been learning about ML and been between applying for career AI and career exercise program. Um, is the techno experience very, required very different for these? Um, so first of all, the scholars program is longer. It's eight months versus an internship, which is shorter. And secondly, the scholars program is focused on publications, whereas the typical internship program, you'll be working with our uh, applied product teams. And so be more focused on research because a lot of these questions are very novel, but research in production. So you wouldn't necessarily publish at the end of it. So those are two differences, but in many ways, uh, what's great is I encourage you to apply for both. <laughs> like, why not? I think that's a great experience. Um, one thing that's uh, fun is that I don't think the technical experience would be very different. Like in many ways, uh, ours might be uh, in many ways more broad in the sense that we only really have 
our criteria are quite explicit and upfront. So we have this technical take home, whereas I think for our regular internships, you, you'll go in and you'll do a technical interview. Whereas we have shifted the emphasis to a take home. And we've also shifted the emphasis to the personal statement. Um, but we're looking for the same things for culture fit. I mean, like a lot of our culture, we, we're really proud of the fact that we're very collaborative. We care a lot about um, really curiosity driven exploration, but also delivery technology that works for everyone. So those culture fit parts will be very similar. Um, so how much knowledge and amount, go ahead, Ellie. I was gonna say, cause I see there are a couple of questions. So uh, Nirjan, can you explain a bit more about the video interview? And I believe Paul asked, does the application process continue after the video interview or is this the last step? So the video interview, it's, it is asynchronous. It's a very short video clip and you'd be invited to participate in that process. So we will review sort of stage one of the application, which is the job application that you submit through our career site. That's the personal statement. That's the take home challenge. That's the link to your resume, any relevant examples. We take a look at that first to make sure that you've got strong enough skills that we think you're going to be a good fit for the program and we have a sense of what you're hoping to get out of it. Then you proceed to the video interview. You get a separate invitation to participate in that. You'll be given a set of questions you'll select one of the questions to respond to. And I'm being intentionally vague about those questions because they are going to be part of the application process. But you pick one to answer in a five minute video. In that video, we just want to make sure that it is clear, it's genuine, it's an authentic response to the question prompt. So you don't need to have the most intense lighting setup. Although if you do have one of those, great, happy to see it. Um, but we're looking for a genuine and thoughtful response. Once you submit, the video portion of the interview that will be considered holistically as part of your application. And then all the applications will be reviewed as full, um, as a full package once the application closes. And we begin that review process after it closes on November 7th. Um, and that's so we can make offers before the end of the year. Yeah, this relates to a question from anonymous attendee. Will we be signing a contract when you join? Yes, it's a full-time contract for eight months. And so you'll be paid on a monthly basis. You'll get a lot of the benefits that we give uh, to like our, you know, interns and full-time employees. So yes, it is a contract-based role. Um, so related to that though, I think it's worth pointing out, Ellie, that there is a matching stage after the video interview. So people have the chance, like we'll we'll have a final pool and that's where there'll be a matching, like proposers will re may reach out and schedule interviews. And so um, I think that's the part where we'll be doing pairing and figuring out. This is also the part where, you know, for those of the people who are saying, I have a brilliant idea, that's the part where you can get in the fray, throw it out there, and then also get a sense of the existing proposals and ultimately make a call as it's for you. Because remember, you're deciding on us as well and our program as well. And that's also where you'll get a sense of what, what leads associated with what proposals. So, you know, who you would work with. So I think that's another way where you can weigh in and see, is this opportunity for me? So um, let's see, we've answered a lot of questions. So we have five minutes. So uh, Nam Namaya Naman says though, I think this is worth clearing up. Is the video due? No, so Ellie will be reaching out iteratively. So she actually is probably gonna start sending requests this week for a few people who have already said, like, I guess it, I, the timing is not exact, but she'll be doing it on a rolling basis. So you'll start to see requests for videos coming in. Yeah, if you haven't received a request, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be selected. It just means like, you know, Ellie's one person and she's trying to figure out, the, yep. get yep. through everything. So, um, but yes, and uh, you know, as we said multiple times, submit early. Um, that that makes that makes your life easier because then your application is in and you get to enjoy the thrill of completing that. Um, and then that helps us review your application sooner as well. So with application review results be announced in advance, give it to give the enough time for the candidate to switch roles. Um, I think Ellie talked to this. Our goal is to give out offers in early December. So and the program is going to start early next year. So um, I think that depends on your, your current role and it depends on what country you're in, like how much advance notice you need to give. But our hope is that we're going to be setting up the successful applicants with information they need to have um, enough time to switch comfortably and be ready for the program. Um, so 
uh, what happens if the group assigned to the proposal doesn't finish the research in time? Honestly, research is, uh, it's hard to precisely determine. So some research directions are riskier than others. And a part of, uh, I think what we'll figure out is just be assessing throughout where the work is and where, uh, it so why does it not fit? Maybe it just didn't work. In which case, I think our goal is to pair uh, to figure out, well, how can we pivot the research idea? But if it is working and it just doesn't finish within the eighth months, that's something we need to assess closer to the end. But I think that's a little bit beyond this step of where we are now. Um, it's a good question, but it's probably more to do with, we were trying to figure out for that group what they want as the outcome and try and figure out how we can support that, whether that's providing compute beyond the program or thinking about ways that we can support it beyond the program. But the program is eight months, so I just want to be upfront about that. It's an eight month experience in terms of the paid and contract and being part of the full-time team. Um, okay, so let's... We have two minutes, Ellie. What should we prioritize? <laughs> Ooh, um, let's see. I, I can also see that Madeline is typing some answers to questions too. This is great. Again, just to reiterate some global themes that have come up here. If you know, use the take-home test as your the take-home challenge as your litmus test for whether or not you're comfortable in this space. So if you don't have an explicit academic or industry background in ML, that's not necessarily a barrier to you applying. Take a good look at the take-home challenge. And if you feel comfortable tackling that, then this could be a really great program for you. We'd really love to see your application. Um, it is remote first and it is a full-time commitment. So don't try to layer multiple things together. You're not setting yourself up for success. This is going to be a very you know, rewarding and intense program. So we want to make sure that you have the time and space to participate really fully. Um, There's a good question here. Will there be the opportunities to attend ML conferences? conferences? Yes. Yeah. So you can attend ML conferences during that period. There will be, we'll try and prioritize at least one conference that especially if you're publishing or submitting work, we'll prioritize those. Uh, so you, if you're submitting work, you can go attend the conference that you submit to. Um, so let's see. Um, I think we should pause there. I think there were a lot of questions. I think we have one minute left. I would say uh, uh, last words. Uh, this is fun. You already showed up to the info session. That makes you already part of a super motivated group. That's really exciting. And I think that I'm super excited to meet some of you down the road and uh, really excited to see your applications. What has inspired you to begin your research journey? So congrats on making the first step. Just coming to this info session. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like it puts you kind of in a group already who cares deeply and, and wants to participate in this program. So thanks, everyone. Everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. They were great. I know we didn't get to all of them, but hopefully we gave you a really strong sense of what to expect and, and how to, you know, engage with the program. Uh, and like Sarah said, we can't wait to meet you. We'd love to see you in the future. Uh, the application for the Cohere for AI Scholars program is open until November 7th. Uh, today is a beautiful day to start working on that application if you haven't already and to submit so that we can take a look at all of the exciting things you've worked on and what you're hoping to accomplish with us at Cohere for AI. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Madeline, for helping to manage the chat. And thank you, Sarah, for leading our Q&A. That was great. Perfect, thanks everyone, okay. bye. Have a great day.